Welcome to our continuing talks with uh, people of Midland and uh, today which is Wednesday the 2nd of September 2020 uh, my guest is Terry Dunham. Uh, Terry worked at the abattoirs for over 30 years, was a respected sportsman in Midland. Um, welcome to our talk Terry and can we start with your uh, place and date of birth? Yes, Donny, I was born in um, Lake Race on the 17th of November 1940. We uh, lived there for probably three years and we finished up in going to Northern with my father who was on the mines. Oh, yeah. We, uh, while we were on the, while we were, while we were in, uh, in uh, Norseman, we, we, uh, my father separated from our family mm. and at the age of four he was gone mm. so we moved to Midland Junction and we lived in 78 Railway Parade and from 70 from from Railway Parade 78 Railway Parade in Midland I went to we were put in an orphanage at the age of seven mm. And or it, might, it might think it's, it's, it's doubtful the date because it, it could have been nine years I've spent in it. Mm. We were in there and I got out of there. We started off at, at Castle Deer, which was, I believe, was their primary school. Mm. And we left there f and to go to high school at, at Clontarf Orphanage. Right. And so, yeah. Sorry, go on. No, from, uh, so from Clontarf, um, you moved back to Midland? Yes, from Clontarf we moved back to Midland and um, we shifted around into 25 Victoria Street. Oh yeah. So that's where you spent most of your youth? Yes, I did. Yeah. Growing yeah. years. Yes. And um, what sort of things did you get up to as a young bloke in Midland? How did you get around? Oh, we rode a, rode a, rode a bike around. Um, I rode a bike until I got my licence, my driver's licence, and mm -hmm. uh, which took a bit of getting but when I finally got it I, 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 I got my first bike um, by bits and pieces mm. and uh, then I when I when I got my driver's license I bought a vehicle which was a 1948 Plymouth oh yeah pretty and big a, car yeah, yeah it was a big car yeah and we had a lot of fun in that mm. and flipped it once and <laughs> yes was that in Midland or out in the? Oh, we, we were out in the we were out in the bush a bit. Where um, Forestville Racetrack is. Oh yeah. So my mate and three or four of our mates we used to go out there and we used to put them through their paces mm -hmm. out there. And did the coppers give you much of a hard time in Midland? We yeah a bit. We um, we we deserved it, but we mm -hmm. yeah we we made a little bit of a name for ourselves, I suppose, yeah. with the way we acted. Yeah. But. It was good times, you know. Yeah. It was, we, and we were, while most of the problems we had with the police was probably traffic. Yeah, we didn't have any other problems. Mm. So uh, you went to the pitches and stuff like that in Italy? Yes, we went to the renowned theatre and the town hall, of course. Yeah. And um, we, in the renowned theatre, there was. Um, uh, yeah. Heron Guts. Heron Guts, too. He, the manager. He, the man, manager. He was. Uh, he was very. He was notorious, and uh, of course, so we 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 uh, the open air theatre. We used to climb the trees and either watch it from the trees or climb the trees, jump the fence, and get in that <laughs> way without paying. And I can understand now why he was a um, little bit angry at us. Yeah. They used to use razor blades for a particular task in, in the Yeah, area. we didn't, but some of them, some of them, you, you, you had to be very careful when you sat down in some of those um, canvas chairs because they, they used to nick the backs of the chairs enough to, to leave them holding up, but when you sat in it, you finished up on the deck. Yeah, the old, <laughs> I heard the old ladies used to come there with their thermos and their, their supper and finish up on finish, the floor. Finish up on we the shouldn't floor. laugh because we're at that age now. Oh yes, we used to, but it was one of the things you used to sit around and wait for, see who mm. was going to hit the deck. <laughs> so rock and roll, rock and roll sort of came on the scene then, was there anything in Midland that was able to... Yeah, 
Warner's at Warnock's at um, at uh, Midvale mm. was the rock and roll joint there. They 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 put up a like a, a sort of a garage and, and in in there they had the music and lights and mm. of course it was all Coca Cola and Fanta at that stage. So yeah. <laughs> desert so boots, desert boots, and pink, pink socks, socks and, <laughs> and plenty of hair. Yeah, and sometimes we, of course, we went to the crew cuts after that. But uh, yeah. and, and there was a fellow named Bodge Carey. He, he was well known. He had his pink socks and his black desert boots, and he yeah. finished up doing well for himself in the police. Yeah, he did. He did. Bodge, and he was a good cricketer too. He was a good cricketer. Good spin. He, he was a good footballer too. Played football with him at Midland. Right. He was, he was so good. you're getting onto the sporting side of it. Um, you, you played quite a few sports. Yes, when I when I first when I first got out of the orphanage, I uh, I joined up with a Bassentine um, athletics club, right. and I did pole vaulting there, and periodically I'd do some some um, high jumps and and uh, and steeple jump steeple jumps. So I uh, the only steeple jumps I ever won was um, sometimes there would only be one or two people come in to, mm. to compete and of course you got points yeah so the coach said to me one day he said do you want to go out into the steeplechase and I said I haven't got a clue and yeah. it doesn't matter so I went into it and we picked up three points for that because I come third <laughs> being, being the third only third person in a race <laughs> <laughs> you know from my recollection is you were pretty athletic so um, you were able to run so footy Footy would have come naturally to you. Yeah, footy did pretty much. I, I, I played baseball before I played football, but right. I, and I also played baseball during football. But and what rounds did you play? I started my I started my baseball on um, on the the Midvale at the Oval at Midvale at. Um, not the MR Reserve. No, no, no. We, we we finished up there. Did you? We formed our road reserve side there. But I started our baseball on the on the on the on the oval at um, at Midvale. Is that opposite the Marshalling Yards, Sterling? Sterling no, 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 no. The Bellevue. I'm sorry, Bellevue Oval. Bellevue Oval. Bellevue Oval. Yes. And it was really. I I think they used to use it for sheep. Um, right? Leeraging stuff uh, periodically, so yeah. there was a lot of sheep manure all over. So you played but baseball and football. I played baseball and football both on that over. On my that baseball, over. I played for Bellevue Rover, Bellevue, and we had a man named Max Kitchens coach. Oh yeah, I remember. And uh, we had a we had a good side, mm. and we won three grand finals in a row. And when Max left, the side fell in a hole, and we mm. we moved across to. Swan Districts yeah. as, a, as a unit and we became their A reserve side oh, yeah. and we played there, we played on the MR oval there near the Midland Railways. Where Centre Point is now. Where Centre Point is now, right. yes. And um, y- y- what was your recollections of uh, Midland Oval in the winter time? Oh, Midland Oval was terrible with the, with the cricket pitches in the centre. Mm. I remember one year the state side came down, they kicked us off and we went and trained in Inglewood or somewhere oh. or Morley and the state side come down there and, and, and trained in the mud so that before they went across to Victoria, play, to Victoria and yeah. played there. Yes. Yeah, I think the Eagles trained there at one stage too. Did they? I, I, yeah. I, I don't, not while yeah, I was there. Yeah, in too. preparation for the MCG. Yeah, it was incredible. And yeah. those grounds. The, 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 you, you could you used to get infections off, off the mud. <laughs> <laughs> Mosquitoes were yeah. good size too. And the, the Bellevue oval, you, you didn't fall over on that in the winter time and you, you come mm. up with infections. And Did you have good change rooms at Bellevue? The change rooms in Bellevue, they've improved a lot, but when I first went there we had a gravel floor, we had no roof and cold water. <laughs> so you didn't have a shower after the game. No. Well, you did. You had you to. You did. Because mm. mm. the, all the mud and the shit and mm. urine stuff from the mm. What was the um, the Bellevue footy team? Were they pretty strong? They were very strong. Yeah, we, yeah. Like I say, we won three grand finals in a row there. Yeah, and they were Bellevue. Uh, Bellevue name? Rovers. Bellevue Rovers. Bellevue Rovers. Yes. Yeah. Mm. So uh, at this stage, uh, were you working? Yes, I started. I started working when I was when I was 
14 when I straight, got straight out of the orphanage and started working mm. at the age of 14 and I started on the beef floor over there. At the Midland Abattoirs? At the Midland Abattoirs, yes. Mm. And I, my first job for about three months was pulling the wizens off, um, my first job was pulling the wizens off, off the lungs and the, and the windpipe of, of the bullocks' lungs. And oh, God. How did you cope with that? Well, it was difficult, but you, we, you just used to put a, get, a, get a start and had to put barefoot and put your toe in there and grab it with two hands and tear the wizened off the lungs. Barefoot? And, 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 yes, and the windpipe. And used to keep the wizened and throw the lungs down a chute. So that was each carcass that came through. Every carcass. It was on a chain, was it? No, it was on. It was underneath the chain. It was down the second floor. Oh. Right. We had a top floor, second floor, and a basement. Right. And I, when I, when I disposed of it, it went down into the basement. This would have been about what, 54, 1954? 1954, Yeah. So you started there basically as a 14 year old. Yes, and I spent, I spent probably three months on the B floor, mm. and then I, then I went into the office. And started just we're doing tickets and, and kill sheets and stuff, mm. ready for the kill. Mm. And I did that until uh, I was fifteen. And uh, when when you first started, um, what made you go to the abattoirs? Like, was there advertising, or did you have to uh, go well, through an interview process? My, my stepfather worked there. He'd, he'd been working there f- for as long as I can remember. So who you know. He, he was there, yeah, he, he was working there when it was solo, right right, right from the very beginning, and um, even during the war he was working there. Right. Do you remember, like, how big it was, approximately how many sheep they might have been killing a day when well, you first started there? When, when, I, when I used to go visiting with him, when it was solo, they used to probably do ten sheep each. They used to go into the, collect their own sheep, bring them out, stick them and, and, and process them themselves. They'd washed it, they, they did everything to it and even put it on the rail ready for pushing out into chillers on their own. So it wasn't a chain process? No, though, no, no. When you first started? Solo, it. yes, they did it right. themselves and they had, at that stage I think they had about five or six slaughtermen that used to do the sheep. Is that right? Then they would go and do cattle. Got right. it, for the, and they'd work a full day? Yes. yes. Yeah. Yeah, uh, gee, they were, were the good old days, weren't no, they? they, they it would they were have been back breaking work. Oh, it was. And they were tradesmen. They, were, they, they did a trade. To, it was an actual trade. As a slaughterman? As a slaughterman, yes. Right. And so, were, so, so once, they, once those carcasses were, were treated by those slaughtermen, what would have been the next process in, in that early stages of the abattoir? Well, they were, they're much the same as it is now, only it wasn't as sophisticated. As, mm. as, they'd just push them along rails and into chillers. Oh, yeah. And when I first started working in my, in my trade, those chillers were still... And they, they, was, they were there till the, till the day I left. Mm. So it's from, from that first job, which... Uh, did you have gloves uh, and protective gear? Personal protective gear to uh, in that job where you were pulling lungs out and oh no 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 the, the lungs came down to shoot I just gathered them and, and took no all I had was your pair, own clothes pair, pair of shorts and a shirt yes <laughs> <laughs> and in my toes <laughs> bare feet bare feet yeah so they were they were able to like they they had hot water to wash the floors down and everything. Yes, it was all did. kept pretty yeah. hygienic. Yeah, oh, it was. No, yeah. Even then, in those days, it was, yeah, but it got more hygienic as we went mm. to export. So um, how did you come to be an apprentice, did uh, the process? I, my, my, my stepfather saw the manager, uh, Norm Hooten, and uh, he set it up, and, and uh, then they come and approach me and ask me, did I want it? I was in the office at that mm. time. And asked me, did I want to be an apprentice? And I said, yes. And uh, I became an apprentice, their first apprentice in the engineering shop as a fitter and turner. A fitter and turner. Mm. Mm. So who were the, who was the, like the, uh, well, the the boss was, you said was? My, my, Norm Hooten. Right. And and in charge of the abattoir, the Midland Junction Abattoir Board at the time. Yeah was Tasman Campbell Rowland and he oh, was okay. in charge of the Middle Junction Abattoir Board and he was he was the manager and Norm Hutton was the, was uh, managing also uh, on the on the production side. 
Right, so once you got into your apprenticeship, did you sort of take to that? Did you enjoy? Yes, it was good. It was, uh, we had, we had um, a couple of loads, one old one and, and one fairly new one. We, had, um, we didn't have a milling machine, we got that later. We had a shaping machine, we had uh, drills and welding equipment. Uh, I did that for, uh, I was a, it was a five year apprenticeship. Yeah. And I was, I took up welding in my, in my third year mm. and learned to weld and so I did a lot of their, all their pressure work welding and refrigeration later yeah. on, which held me in good stead. Did they, did they employ other apprentices after you? Yes, uh, I got out of my time when I was 20 years old and one month on the 12th of December. Mm. And um, I, I uh, went out on the tools. My my first, my first job on it was on a weekend. We were going to do some work on a conveyor, and I was 20 years old in one month, and thought I was pretty smart. And they had a 45-year-old labourer working with me. And I said, "We'll go out there and we'll do this, this, and this." He said, "Listen, Sonny," <laughs> and he told me and put me back in my place. Yeah, is that right? <clears throat> So, um, what other what other jobs um, like was the abattoir starting to expand when you were during your yes it, it, the abattoirs by by nature for, expand all the time they can't mm. stand still you've got to keep up mm. one to keep up financially you've mm. got to you've got to you've got to make it as financially mm. possible as possible mm. to run and therefore mechanically you, mm. you try and get as, as little labour in it as you possibly mm. can. And you would have had study to do during your apprenticeship? Yes, when I did my apprenticeship I wanted to become a marine engineer because an, an engineer in, in an abattoir or a hospital is, it's virtually marine, mm. like, a, like, a, like a ship. Mm. It's got steam, hydraulics, pneumatics, mm. um, refrigeration. We had, we had acres and acres of refrigeration. Mm. We had a, an engine room. Prob- was probably, probably the biggest in, in Western Australia, mm. and it was massive. And, mm. um, and and that it kept expanding. Also, the whole mm. works expanded, and we, mm. we went. For, we finished up with three mutton chains from from Solo to three mutton chains. Yeah, uh, over what period of time would that have been? Oh, it would have. It 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 sort of rolled in to to. To um, to the next section, you, you just, like I said, you just never stop building. Yeah. So See, it would have been, it would have been, oh, when probably fifty four, fifty five. They they started the building then, yeah. and then it progressed from then on up to three chains, and and, and they renewed the B floor. Uh, they went. That went to a, a, a nearly a, a very, very sophisticated B floor, mm. and the pig floor was the same. They they they, they upgraded that, mm. put all modern equipment in, mm. automatic singes and and mm. dehairing plants and, and and stuff like that. It was when um, you were doing your study uh, during your apprenticeship, where, where did you do that? I I went to I went to day school. Um, once a fortnight to to Perth um, Technical College, mm-hmm. but during the night I wanted to be a I wanted to see if, wanted to become a um, marine engineer if I mm-hmm. could, mm-hmm. so I took up maths, technical drawing, and English mm-hmm. three nights a week for three years in mm-hmm. the Railway Institute, as a matter of fact, across there, and that's still there. That uh, just uh, on the Atlanta Street crossing. Yes, that, and the railway institute. Well, I did that for three years, and um, but it never eventuated because because you really, it was really difficult. Most most in marine engineers in those days went away to sea, mm. and you were away, away mm. to sea for at least six years. But that um, <clears throat> that knowledge that you picked up at night school, um, as you progressed through your career, would have been. Quite handy. Yeah, yeah, it was it was yeah. I, well, I couldn't have survived without it. It was it was great because mm. I started off started off as a as an apprentice. Then then in um, at at fourteen years of age, no, fifteen years of age, I started off, and then at twenty years of age, I was a tradesman. Mm. And then I, I like I said, I took up welding in my third year. That helped mm. me also. And I became a 
leading hand when I was 24 or 25. Mm. I think I'm a senior leading hand when I was 27. Mm. And at 30, 29, 30, I was foreman of the engineering works there. But you really took to this engineering business like a duck to water. It was, it was great, yeah. But 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 the, it was the best place in the world to, to learn a, an apprenticeship and mm. to become a tradesman. You just it was just so versatile. It was just, yeah, because of that expansion, there was always something different to do. Obviously, it, it was, and it changed. It just changed, and you had to change with it, mm. and that was good. Um, so the, the tradesmen you work with, um, do you remember any of those blokes? Yes, I had um, J- Jimmy Mueller was a was a tradesman there. Uh, Ernie Wooler was a tradesman. I got one of my my, my immediate uh, my first one was um, was Bill Brown. He was he was in a he was a fitter and turner. Came over from from he was Scotchman, but he came from England, and he served his apprenticeship and did his work in an aircraft factories. Mm. So the knowledge I got from him was magnificent. Mm. He was he was brilliant. And did you have much to do with the sail yards? Yeah, well, well, I, I built shelters in the rain for the sail yards so that they could have their sails in the shelter. So that, were, that would have been welding. <laughs> that uh, was welding. Or, yeah, all steel yeah, work. All steel works. Yeah. And steel posts and, and yeah. iron roofs. So the sail yards were expanding, obviously, with, with the number of kill increasing. The sail Definitely, yards were expanding yeah. too. So and, and they got covered more and more and more under cover. Mm. They, we we went from the sail yards, in, finished up under 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 cover, and we built extra learages for sheep and for cattle. Mm. What was the learage, Jerry? The learage, the learage is a is a, is, a, is a covered area where the sheep are, are kept prior to going up for for, for processing right. and cattle. Mm. So, with this expansion taking place. Um, my recollection of the chain running through backwards and forwards, um, as as the number of chains increased, were you involved in installing those chains? Yes, involved in all of them, and uh, we just they increased in length and they increased in in, in the number of times they went <laughs> north and south. Mm. It was quite quite a trip to do mm. to do you know to get one carcass from from sticking up to. Mm up to the chillers so it wasn't just the sheep she, the, the mutton floor as they called it mm. there were other floors also can you oh, describe yes. them yes there was a there was a pig floor which which started off fairly fairly ordinary and that finished up nearly fully automated mm. well you still had to have the people there to, to, to check and mm. to, to gut and stuff but uh, mm. yeah that that was a very very modern at mm. its time a very modern pig floor pig floor and we could do 800, 900, depending on the speed. All, mm. you, all your killing and your processing depended, depended on speed. Mm. And tell, tell uh, what you, what you, the, um, the, the slaughtermen themselves had certain numbers of sheep and cattle that they would do in a certain amount of time. Tally. Tally, that's right. And mm. that dictated the speed of the chain, of course. Mm. Mm. And also the number you could get in a day. Mm. Mm. So, but we, they, they, these chains, they continually improved and were more modified, and sped up and mm. and lengthened. And so, so was the chain a continuous process on the slaughter floor, or did it actually um, move down to the storage areas for the carcasses? When you, when you, when they were brought in at ground floor. And they were they were stuck downstairs, mm. and uh, they were, that was done in, in it finished up in in controlled uh, feeders, mm. and they were they were stunned first, and then they were stuck, and then they went up to the floor first mm. floor, mm. and on that floor the process of of of, um, proce- of, of skidding and all started. That was there. when all the blokes were lined up. They were lined up doing yes, their individual, individual yeah, tasks. Had, that's right. Each one had an individual task, and it went from the sticking where they mm. bled out right through the length of the chain. Mm. They went. Uh, they went from the chain to the chillers. Mm. No, I'm sorry. They went from the chain to a hanging area prior to the chillers, mm. and um, a lot of that was to prevent cold shortening. But they went from the from the chain. They hung in there for three, four hours, and they were put mm. into chillers when they cooled down a little. 
Can you explain cold shortening? Well, cold shortening is, is if you get something and it's warm, say it's been freshly killed or, or if it's fresh meat even and it's warm and you put it in a, in a from, from that warm and you put it into a, into a chiller or a freezer, it gets it, it, it tightens up all the nerves in, in the body mm. and, it, and, it, and it creates in fact it toughens the meat mm. what they did to alleviate that in the end they put in we didn't have it on the mutton floor but uh, they, they put in a they put in a a sterile a, 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 a char, a, I forget what it was called now we, we electrified the rails and the, and, and um, Put a put a charge through the carcasses, and that sh- that short that that made the car- carcasses tense right up as they would in a freezer, mm. and then they relaxed again. Mm. And um, when they when you could see the you could see the legs going up and then coming mm. down when they relaxed, mm. and when they went in they didn't they didn't cold shorten like like if they weren't. So that that problem stunned. was overcome. You, you, it, that's the way to overcome it. Yeah, yeah was was that um, a common problem like throughout Australia that, that you heard? It, yeah, yeah. It, it was it was done very very late in the, in, in the piece yeah. when I was when I was. In fact, I think the first one put in in Western Australia was put in at Rob Jetty. Mm. Mm. Um, the the supervisors each each area of the um, um, the abattoirs had. Supervisors in each yes. area. Can you remember and name any of those? Boys? Yes, it was uh, Joey Mountain was one of them. Vince Wovaditch was another one. What was Joe um, in charge of? Joe was in charge. Joe was in the, on the mutton floor. He was right. in charge of that area there. Um, and um, Vince Wovaditch was was on the beef floor. Right. And um, they were very good at their job too. Mm. There must have been a bloke hanging around the yard too. Oh yes, there was in the sale yards. There was uh, Bill Swanson was in the sale yards, and one of the fellas there was from out the Swan. And um, Billy Sundo, oh, yeah. and he was in the, he was in the, he was in the oh, yeah. region the sale yards yeah. as well. So, if we come to the um, the technical side of your job that you would have progressed into with. Um, like the boiler operations and engine rooms and freezers and oh, yes. with the expansion um, or the capacity uh, of the abattoirs to provide steam, hot water and the like must have uh, new new things would have had to be built. Uh, the, can you describe the say the function of the boiler room? Yeah, well, the first the first the first boilers they had there were a were a, a wood boiler. They're a log like a sleeper, mm. a jar or whatever you could get. But it was mainly jar, and they, they were logs like about the size of a sleeper. They were yeah. quite heavy, and they used to throw them in and then push them in with a rod to get them right into the back of the boiler. That was a back breaking job that was, because mm. you had to open the door to the furnace. Yeah. And throw the logs in, and then poke them down and stack them up. How many furnaces were there? We had we had three boilers there that did that mm. initially, and then um, while I was there, we took out two of the two of the the wood boilers, and and um, in the space that that was there, we we put sawdust boilers, and they were. Um, the, the, the boilers there were, were fed sawdust, which we got from all around the place. We got a lot from the workshops, the little mm. workshops, and we used to cart it in. And, and it used to be, be, there used to be beaters that used to throw the sawdust into the fed in with conveyors, and it was thrown in through beaters, and the sawdust was suspended in the air and on fire, and that was that was how they were fed. And there was just it was drafts, force mm. drafts coming in from the bottom. Used to set fire to the to the, to the sawdust, and they got their heat from that. There must have been massive stockpiles of sawdust there. Yeah, we had a huge stockpile down. Was it in a bin or was it outside? No, it was outside. It was out. We, we had we had some, but in, in bins. But, but we used to have to cart it up to there, mm. and it was and uh, it was dumped by a truck into a into a pit and mm. it was 
fed up into into the into ta- into uh, holding mm. tanks for the sawdust up above the boilers. And gravity fed down. No, it was fed. It was screwed to them. Oh, okay. And screw conveyors. Oh, okay. So yeah. the blokes didn't have to actually no, no. open doors and. Oh no. It was no, a mechanical no, no, operation. It was, all, it was all mechanical, and it, mm. then it was fed in, and then the drafts used to take over and mm. keep it suspended and burning. So how how long would they have used sawdust? Do you reckon? Well, we used we used sawdust for a long, long time, and um, and then in fact, yes, we used sawdust. We used sawdust right up until we put in two large, very large oil-fed boilers. Mm. And we're still using the sawdust as well as the oil-fed right. boilers. Mm. And then we shut down the, the spare wood one that we had was, mm. was just left there, mm. as, and it was it stayed there. So the the function of the boilers, what what uh, what was the next step after? What 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 did the boilers do? Well, the, the boilers would you you heated up you heated we had steam and and they and the steam made you hot water, so you had coils going through through tanks of hot water, and the steam heated the water up. And, and um, to, to whatever temperature you required mm. it. And we also used steam with the old, with the old water to, to wash down. This is for, to, to go up to the to floors? To go up to the kill floors, to wash mm. the kill floors down. Mm. We used steam water on the kill floors mm. to, to wash the kill floors down, which was all heated up by these boilers. Mm. And uh, we had three very large hot water tanks and we used to use that water to, to wash the floors down, mm. kill so, floors. So that would have been pretty much boiling water? Or very, very, very close. Very was that close. a controlled temperature? It was. It, out of them, it, it, it didn't start off as that. It started off as a mixture with steam and, and cold water. Mm. And then we went from that to hot water mm. and steam and hot water. So the blokes on the floor, the wash down blokes, they would, they would have uh, had to have protective gear yeah, they because it would have been really hot. The water was fairly hot. They used yeah. to wear gloves. And... So if we, can, if we can follow when the water went on the floor, where did that go? It, it, it was washed. They, they did, they did a, first of all, they, they did a, a quick wash and then they would put a, a, a sterilising sterilizing and soap agent on the floor mm. and then they'd wash that down and it all went down to, a, to an effluent, effluent plant. At the at the waste treatment plant at the at the uh, western end of the of the abattoir, hmm. it gravitated down there. It all gravitated down there. So even in the early days, there was a form of waste treatment. Uh, well, the with the well, I'll get to the waste treatment. But as far as the water went, the water went into into dams, and they were um, a, a, anaerobic and aerobic dams. Hmm. And, and the, the anaerobic one had a had a, a crust on it. To keep certain bugs lived in that, mm. and in the aerobic, certain bugs lived in that, and the, and the water was virtually treated by microorganisms mm. in these dams. And it originally, were there chemists there to? We control? graduated. We graduated from those dams, which were as old as the hills. Mm. We graduated to the, from those dams to a play, to a thing called an active, activated sludge system. Which had dissolved air flotating air flotation systems and mm. it was a million dollars mm. system that was put in to try and clean up the, the water mm. and the idea was to use it uh, where we could or use it for sprinkling in the paddocks for sheep for stock adjustment and stuff. So how far did you have to pump the water? Well, once once this once this system this um, actified sludge system once that was up and running we used to pump the water from from the abattoir right up to Ridge Hill mm. in a six inch, six inch line. We used to pump it up to Ridge Hill to a dam there and from the dam we used to sprinkle it over the paddocks up there where sheep were registered. This would have been up under, under Midland Road? Would yes. Go under yeah, Midland Road? Yeah, that's right, over Midland Road, right up to Ridge Hill. Oh, it went over Midland Road or was went, it an underground? It went under, it went under, underground, under, 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 underground went, we, we sort of followed the river. Mm. And we went through all the paddocks going up to Ridge Hill. So uh, when these blokes were washing down, um, there must have been a fair bit of solids still on the floor. Was that separated? There was solids. Solids were separated. Even blood was separated. Try to keep the blood because the blood was valuable. So the solids, all the solids went the same place as the gut and everything up to the byproducts. 
a separate section. Separate section. So water the, went to the waste treatment plant. Yes, and, and, the, and, the, and, and there was and a the separate waste, the solids went up mm. to the byproducts. So there must have been a separation point. Was there a machine to separate the solids and the water? It, it was. It was. It, the, it, it was put through um, strainers, like a, a mm. rotary strainer, no. which, which the solids, the solids were taken, were fed out one end of it, and the water mm. went through screen into into a drain and finished up down the effluent plant again. Right. So if we could just um, move across to this process, uh, the solids going to the byproducts. Um, the byproducts must have been um, rather a large building, was it? Yes, it's 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 very large. It was um, it was it was almost as large as a kill floor. Mm. It was almost as large as a kill floor. So was that the waste off the floor plus bones and bones, scraps from boning trimmings rooms? and gut? And and all that went up there. When so, the gut, gut was emptied out, what what didn't go to for, for casings and kept for trite, everything went up there. Right. And, and, and it was it initially it was taken up there. They they used to it used to come down the chute and used to come into trolleys, and it was pushed into a lift, and then taken up in a lift and put into the cookers. Right. And, and when that that changed from that to a screw conveyor. Oh, yeah. So how many cookers were there? There was 10, 12, 12 cookers, wow. and they were they were they were they were big cookers. They would be in, they would have been fifteen feet long and four feet in diameter. Because mm. there was always a thing feet. in Midland about the smell. Um, yes, and the Midland abattoirs got blamed for a lot of the smell. Midland abattoirs got blamed for a lot of the smell, and, and I dare I say we were still getting blamed when we were shut down. And uh, we ourselves put in um, a, a, a treatment for our gases and, 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 and any air, anything that went to atmosphere, we, we ourselves put in huge amounts of, 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 of gathering and, and, and to, to burn it off. To, 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 to catch the extraction. Right. So, and we used it, one, you use it, you, you use it as an agent to heat up water. Mm. Because a lot of it was hot, mm. and two to, to stop, stop it from going to the atmosphere, we used to catch it and cool it and condense it, and then send it back down to the floor. So, did, did the blokes at the abattoirs design that? Initially, we did, but then we started buying in um, heat exchangers and stuff, and and we, we put it through heat exchangers and they were mm. bought, they mm. bought, as were the the cookers were all bought. Mm. We had. We had to get to get back to the odour. Mm. My after we had shut down, my my boss used to ring me up. I'd, I he could ring me up at one or two o'clock in the morning and say he's getting complaints, and I had to go down to Midland from Mulgany Creek mm. and stick my head out the window of my car and see if I could smell what I could smell and bring him back. Is that right? <laughs> and and when uh, when when after we shut down and, and it, as it turned out it wasn't us at all it was Fertel and Telemann yeah. who, who were causing the problem mm. uh, and but I, they've stopped that now but um, we we had we had um, at any given time practically we had one case one case in court one paying a fine for one and another one pending is that right. <laughs> For, for smells, yes, right. it was quite a bad time for us. So, so the once the once the, uh, the 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 solids and everything were processed, what uh, what was the final product to be able to sell? The meal, the meal was meal was a good saleable product. The, the, all the, any of the any of the trimmings and the, and the hocks and, and stuff. Sometimes you'd save the hocks for the crayfish, but but otherwise it, it was all broken up in pre-breakers. And taken up to the cookers and cooked, mm. and made into meat meal. Mm. It was a good money spinner, and tallow was was extracted, and tallow was also sold. How was and that stored? It was stored in huge tanks. We had we've had uh, we had five five mm. large, very large tallow. So tanks. that would have been in liquid form. <laughs> liquid form, yes, with coils in it, steam coils in it to heat it up, oh, and to solidify keep, to keep it. When it hit, when it solidified, didn't matter if it solidified. When it solidified, if you wanted to, if you wanted to uh, dispose of it, selling it, mm. you had to heat it up with with these thin coils. Mm. 
and that, that they worked perfectly. There must have been a big market for tallow then. Oh, there was, there was. Mm. It used to get overloaded a bit and they, they would um, break your price down to next mm. to nothing sometimes. Yeah, so uh, the, the tallow in the meat mill was basically an export product, was it? Yes, it was, and blood. We used to dry the blood, oh, keep yeah. the blood as much as you could and dried that. Yeah. And that was sold as, as, as blood. Mm. Was the or, bone... Yeah, sorry. Well, they, sometimes they added blood to meat meal. And oh, yeah. It depends what the, what the, what the buyer wanted. Oh, yeah. And, and uh, there must have been a lot of bones coming out of boning rooms. And yes. Uh, that, how, how was, was that included in the... Yes, that was, yeah, that was all part of the blood. The meat meal was just really blood and bone. Mm. How did they crush them up? The, we, we had pre-breakers. And they, they 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 spun around some fifteen hundred reps a minute, wow. and they were they would um, they used to smash it all up into into just mm. pulverise it. And, and you would have had to maintain them, yes. and if they broke down, you'd have to get in and yes, and the cookers and, and the, the cookers, cookers. Yeah. yeah. So moving on to the the engine room and the process, uh, because as the abattoirs expanded. There were big freezers built down the back to cater for carcasses and carton meat for export. So that expansion must have taken a lot of, um, you know, working out as to how to uh, construct those yes. freezers. And so, so if you could describe from the engine room to the freezer process. Yeah, that from the engine room. That that. The, even the engine room itself, that had to grow with the abattoir. At the bigger, the bigger the stock numbers that were that were processed, then so the engine room had to expand with mm. it. So we were continually upgrading that with more modern equipment, mm. and um, and re, and and the engine room itself had to be expanded. Yeah. So that was all done. We 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 had huge receivers, ammonia receivers down the bottom. Mm. And though we had two very large ones of eight metres by about a metre in diameter. Mm. And um, they were very large. So the, the ammonia uh, was stored in these tanks. Where did that come from? It was, it was brought in, it was brought in, in um, 850 pound bottles and, 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 and kept topping up these receivers. Mm. And it came from I forget where where we got it from, but it came we we, we brought it in from the outside, mm. and um, once once the receivers were three quarters full, we we just left them at that and just kept topping them up with these mm. small bottles. Can you explain to us um, the process of the ammonia going through the system to create the the cooling for the freezers and the and the chillers? Yes, it's it's pretty. It's it's pretty technical, but to just briefly to, to, to put it roughly, you would we you would start we, you would start with the ammonia, of course, which was connected up to a to a, an accumulator, mm. which which maintained a level, and from the accumulator, the ammonia was pumped up to the refrigeration units. Mm. The ammonia was pumped up to the refrigeration units, which were up in the in the in the floor. We had, like I said, we had we had three floors of, of refrigeration over the whole area of the abattoir, mm. Mm. and it was very large. That was twenty four hour. Twenty four hours, yeah, mm. seven days a week it ran. There must have been a lot of piping. Oh, miles and miles of piping, which also was upgraded. The further you went, the the larger the pipe mm. you had to get it, to get it there. Did, did you a part of your task there was to to weld those pipes, or was that an external contractor? Well, I did some of it. I did some of it, but most of it was outside contracted. If mm. we did our own, if we altered a freezer ourselves or a chiller ourselves, we did the work ourselves. Mm. But anything that was that would tie us up too long because we had to run the abattoir. Mm. Anything that was that was required in any length of time. We used to bring in the outside contractors, but mm. we did what we could. And a lot of our chain extensions we did ourselves. Mm. And then we also brought in contractors too if it was too big. How many tradesmen did you finish up having under you when you were like a foreman there? Well, at one stage we had, we had, we had plumbers, electricians, sheet metal workers, welders, fitters, and we would have had um, a force of 
nearly 50. Mm. Because the, the abattoirs was a major employer in Midland. Uh, yes, the abattoirs, the abattoirs employed over 600 people. When mm. it was shut down, 600 people lost their jobs. Mm. That was at the end. That was at the end, yes. Mm. But they were, they, at that period, there were 600 people working. Mm. Um, just coming back to this operational side, uh, these, uh, like the, the boiler operation, must have had uh, an exhaust system like smokestacks and chimneys and stuff. Yeah, yeah, we had. Did you have any experiences with them? Yeah, we had we had three chimneys, one one off the new boilers, and one was there right from the start with the old boilers, the old brick chimney. Mm. That was there right from the very beginning. And uh, then we put a, another steel one in, which was 100, 120 feet high. Mm. And um, I used to inspect that once a month just to make sure everything mm. was all right. It, it, it originally had cables on it, but they rattled and banged, so we took them off. We didn't. We had them taken off. I said it was safe. But anyway, uh, after, after it had been going for oddly, oh, I don't know, I, once a month I inspected it right from, almost from when I was, when we first put it in. I, I, we were, I was climbing up at once on an inspection up the ladder, which was enclosed, and and I and I, looked, I could see daylight through the other side of the chimney, yeah. and, and about two thirds of the way up, but it snapped, and it was all it was holding it was the ladder, I think, and, and <laughs> I nearly died. <laughs> so I had to go up there, and, and I, I I had to get up there, and I welded my own lugs on and went around the side of the stack, stack and and uh, gouged it out, welded it all up, and put stiffeners in, and. How high would that have been, that break? I would have been, I'd have been a hundred feet up, I suppose. Wow. Yeah, it was quite... On your own? Yeah, I was quite a labourer, but he, he, he had to be underneath me. He would have, been, feeding, one man he would have been feeding the, um, like the, the welding... Oh, he, he, he was, he was he, once I got out of the cage, mm. you, only, you could only have one person in a cage at a time. Oh, yeah. Once you got out of the, off the ladder, cage, the, the cage around the safety cage around the ladder, mm. I, built a, I built a platform around mm. the, I built a platform around the, the chimney to be able mm. to access the, the crack, mm. which I did, and uh, yeah, so it was very hairy. <laughs> So if there, if there was a refrigeration problem in the boning rooms, there were a lot of private operators over there. Um, if there was a problem, you, you had to, it was, it was you and your blokes tasked to get in and, and make sure the temperature was controlled properly. Yeah, exactly. But that's, that's the, actually, I spent most of my time in refrigeration towards the end of mm. the last 10 years. I was mainly in the engine room. Right. And um, doing doing refrigeration. And those new freezers, uh, they must have taken up. Uh, did, did they? They must have taken up a lot of time to sort of keep them functioning as they should. Were, were they very reliable? Yeah, they were, they were very reliable. But we had a lot of we had a lot of trouble initially when we first when we first. Of course, the engine room had to be nearly double the size of it. it had to be nearly doubled to to put those. Uh, there's extensions in. That was a million cubic foot million freezer. Million cubic foot freezer and ten and eleven B. They, yeah. were, they were later additions, and they were they were very very large, mm. and um, and of course they were two hundred meters away from the engine room too. Mm. So we had to get the refrigeration down to them from there, still from the engine room. And they were pushed. How was everything pushed down from the engine room? It it was all it was all done by the compressors. Right. It was the compressors pushed the whole lot down and sucked it back. How many compressors were there in the engine room? We'd have had um, initially they initially they had three big old piston jobs, mm. and there's one of them out at Whiteman Park now. Mm. And they, they they took it there and, and they've kept that for posterity, which is a really good thing. It's got a huge ten foot or twelve foot size pulley on it, mm. driven by a belt. And it's, that's still out there, I think. I'm not sure. I haven't been out there lately to see, but it was out there. It was, it was a good indication of yeah. what the old equipment was like, a big, huge piston mm. crankshaft. Mm. Then we went to piston compressors, and then we changed from that to screw compressors. Right. And they, they, they got more sophisticated and more, more expensive. Mm. But they, were, they did the job too. Mm. So you must have gone through, uh, or the abattoirs would have gone through, 
a few managers. Can you remember the, the general managers? Yes, I can remember there was Tasman Campbell, Roland, there was Norm Hooton, there was Dudley Rollins, there was um, um, Dick Boswood. Dick Boswood, there was um, Brian Wilson and Ian Flack. Mm. I think Ian Flack was the last one mm. when, when it shut down. He I was the last so. one and he went to mm. um, he went to Rob Jetty. Mm. So we, we're getting towards that closure that um, when did you hear or feel that uh, this whole thing was going to come to an end and uh, the live shipment of uh, stock was going to take over the... the well, it, it, was, it was a cross-up between the live shipment of stock and the cost, I suppose. The government, as, as dare I say, as, as the governments take, for instance, an election, you, the, 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 the word was said, the rumour was had, that as long as the Liberal Party were in, they were going to shut it down, and mm. as long as the Labor Party was in, they were going to open, leave it open. Mm. So every, every four years you really didn't know whether you were going to have a job or not. Mm. But be that as it may, when it finally came to the crunch, the, the live shipping did kill us in as much as the people overseas didn't really want it dead. They wanted, they wanted it to kill themselves. Mm. Uh, mainly, say Muslim countries, for instance, they mm. wanted it. So mm. They just wanted to kill it religiously, and it was hell hell here as well. Mm. We had hell hell, but hell hell was just one of their imams saying prayers, and, mm. and the, the fellow that did the sticking, he he would say a prayer as he as he killed each carcass. Mm. That was a big market. It was a monstrous market to mm. the Middle East, yes. So the closure took place in, well, not the closure, the, the, the cease of operation basically in 1978. Yes, yeah, yeah, right. uh, And so what was the process from the, the government deciding and making the decision that the place was going to shut down? It was shut down and kept on care and maintenance in case they wanted to start it up again. Well, there was another election. That was another election. <laughs> so we kept it on care and maintenance for three years or so, yeah. I think, and, and then um, and then they shut it down altogether. And they still used the sale yards even after it was shut down. I think. Yeah. So and which is now out um, out at Mujay, Muj, 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 Yeah. yeah. There's so, a big development at the sale yards now. You just wouldn't know that place existed. Yeah. So uh, Bunnings is in the middle. Of it. Yeah, um, July nineteen eighty one was when they decided that was it. Yes, it was yes. sold off to, to uh, Brickyard. Yeah. Yes. And um, so you were without a job then. No, I went from I went from there. I, well, well, I, I worked my way up to foreman. I went from there to be the commission engineer for the West Australian Meat Commission at mm. Rob Jetty. And I was there for 10 years at mm. Rob Jetty. Mm. And after that, when Rob Jetty shut down, mm. I went and worked for the uh, Department of Commerce and Trade. Mm. Uh, for a start, my first job for them was to pull down Rob Jetty Abattoir for them. Mm. So just getting back, if we can just go back, backtrack a little, you, you were at Rob's for quite a length of time. Yes, 10 years. And you had a great responsibility there. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's so like the engineer's job for the, for the, for the whole works. Yes. How many people would you have under you there? Probably 25 or 30. Mm. And was that, that operation wasn't as big as Midland? No, they didn't have pigs when I went there. Right. They only had beef and mutton. Right. And uh, so, because Mid Midland, Midland, we were capable of doing eight or nine hundred pigs, yeah. a thousand head of cattle if we wanted to. How many sheep? Probably ten thousand. Mm. Well, lambing season was quite big. Lambing season was massive. Yes, mm. lambing season was massive. Yeah. So, Robs, you were you were um, you were the boss there? As in um, the year, yes. Yeah, yeah. 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 Well, we, of course, we had we had. Um, 
people, the people that ran the engine room for the, for us, the, 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 the engine drivers and all that, boilers and that, they were under the engineer as well. They were part of my staff. Yeah, so it was mainly administrative role rather than tools and hands-on. Yes, but you had to be you had to be right at the coal face though. You had to be there to be there. To, yeah, otherwise mm. it it just wasn't it was just too difficult mm. to do. Well, was it a difficult transition from Midland to Robs? I don't think we were very popular mm. <laughs> because they thought we were going to shut them down too. Mm. Because by this time it became the WA Meat Commission. The WA Meat Commission, yeah. They, they, we were the WA Meat Commission at Midland as well. Mm. They had changed from the Midland Junction Abattoir Board to the WA Meat Commission. Mm. I can't remember what date that was, but uh, mm. that, that included... Uh, Rob Jetty as well as Midland, and that was all under the Agriculture Department. Oh yeah. So, um, how did the end come about at Rob's? It, you, you went through that process of um, uh, the place closing up at Midland and the, and the insecurity that you would have felt there, and then exactly the, you went through exactly the same thing Exactly the same thing at, at uh, Royal Jetty, and, and that and that finished up the same way. It just it just got got to the point where they didn't want it as a as a unit anymore, mm. and, and they got rid of it. So did you dismantle the buildings? Were you involved I, in the I, dismantling? I was, yeah, I was with with the, I was the the man on the ground for the Department of Commerce and Trade when the abattoir was demolished, right from the start. Initially. I had to. We still had, even even when it was being demolished, mm. we we had we had so many hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of of uh, carpets and stuff still frozen, in um, and and cartons mm. still frozen at the beginning, mm. in rooms. So as they demolished, we had to keep bringing the refrigeration back because mm. we were running it to, mm. to support. This. Then we got rid of it, of mm. course, and then. Then I just uh, evacuated the whole mm. system of ammonia, and, and then mm. we just demolished that as well. So when you walked out of there, was it just flat? Was it just a block of land? Just a chimney standing. It was a chimney standing. We spent we spent ten thousand dollars in upgrading the chimney to keep it as a as a as a heritage. Yeah, for the mm. for the uh, for the Rob Jetty where the Rob Jetty was. So you were without a job. I was without a job, and I and I. Got a job with the, with the Department of Commerce and Trade. Then, the, the, initially, I was I, I went straight from the abattoir as as commission engineer. Once they shut, I started. I, I formed my own company called right. Southern Coast Proprietary right. Limited, and, and I I did that work for the for the Department of Commerce and Trade. It was done under my own trade. Under my own company, yes. So that was when, you, you, so your entitlements from um, the WME Commission ceased. transferred over to the Department of Commerce? No, they ceased. Well, they ceased I was, when... I, I was paid off. Yes, right. With everybody else. So what function did you perform at the WA Department of Commerce? With the Department of Commerce and Trade, we, we put in, we started, once, once we got, once Rob was demolished and cleaned up and, and, and everything was gone, we were, and during, I, I was putting in beach access paths and, and roadways and, and uh, there was a, a, um, a, a, a facility put in there for barbecues and, and, mm. and, um, and for, for, for the public to be able to use. Mm. So you were, you were um, sourcing contractors to do all this? I didn't do it personally. It was done. I just supervised it with the department. Oh, yeah, okay. Right. So there was a piece of artwork down there too. Yes, that was that was done. That was done while I was with the Department of Commerce and Trade. It was outsourced by by the Department of Commerce and Trade, and it was put in there as as a reminder of the people using the beach for horse racing and mm. um, horse training. And that's still going on today, the, the training. They, mm. They're still swimming horses down mm. there today. So the area we're talking about is behind the powerhouse, the old abattoirs? It's, it's and north, north of the powerhouse right. and, and south of the, south of the, the um, breakwater. The, oh, yeah. the, uh, so um, it was a C.Y. O'Connor memorial. Yes, there, it's somewhere. a C.Y. O'Connor memorial about 
30 metres off the, off the beach. Did you have anything to do with that? Sorry? Did you have anything to do with that? No, I didn't do it personally, but I, I, I was there when it, when it was being put up and I mm. was with Commerce and Trade when they had sourced that to be, to be manufactured and, mm. and put up out there too. How did they anchor that into the seabed? It's, it's done in concrete. It's, um, it's, it's, it's more modern art than it. It's diffi- fairly difficult to pick up actually, but it's, mm. it's a modern art type thing as is the, the horse racing mm. um, thing. And the the jetty at Rob's jetty was quite an historic uh, structure because ships came in from the north carrying cattle and they were all herded into the abattoirs for for slaughter. I think there are still some races there from memory. Yeah, we kept we kept them there uh, as a as a just as a memento of, of what the, of what it was what was there. So you were well, involved well, with the demolition there, yes. of the actual jetty itself. No, that was that practically demolished itself it gradually got it gradually broke away and broke away and shortened off shortened off until mm. such time as there was, really wasn't much there mm. Mm. originally there was a pipeline going out an oil pipeline mm. about a i think it was about a 10 inch or 12 inch oil pipeline going mm. out mm. to the jetty where these vessels used to and i'm not sure if but the submarines did but uh, whether but there was an oil pipeline going out mm. there and i had to blank that off i blanked mm. that off how long were you with the Department of Commerce, working for them as a as a contractor, as it were? Probably, probably two years, three mm. years. So you were approaching retirement age then. Yes. Mm. Yes, I was. So you were just once, about, you were once, ready to finish. Yeah. Once, once, once I had finished, once I had finished there with with the Department of Commerce and Trade, I. I left there and I virtually, I, I, I still had the company, hmm. but um, I started I, I started building an abattoir out of Mandurah, east of Mandurah hmm. for, a, for a, 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 a company called Nebrew Exports, which is Rob Nottle was the hmm. owner of that, and, and I, we, we there was already some facilities there, and, and, and we built the abattoir there to, to do 500 head of cattle. Mm. Would have, it sped up, would have done 500 head of cattle, mm. and it was it was fairly modern. It was it was a good place. Mm. We put in new refrigeration and mm. uh, new new engine room and, mm. and compressors. It was mm. ammonia also. Yeah. You were the man for the job, by the sound of it. Well, it was very handy because yeah. I was at this, that stage. I was living in Mandurah too, oh, yeah. which kept me it kept so, me very busy. Yeah, when the time came to retire, you were ready for it. I certainly was. It really, actually, that place actually started get to get to me. I, I, I ran up the engineering side of it, among other stuff, for it for mm. for two years, mm. two and a half years, and, um, and then it, I just I just had to go. So mm. I went. And um, I think he ran for another two years, and then, mm. and then that shut down. So I'm not a very good person to employ to build a laboratory. <laughs> I shut it. three of them down. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, l- looking at your career, Terry, for a Midland boy with the tough background that you came from, um, you should be very proud of yourself. We certainly are, as a Midland boy, going through that process and finish up in a managerial position. Uh, Thanks very much for your chat today. Thanks, John.